OK, so if we then kind of come back to some diatomic molecules, and I wanted to highlight a couple things here. One is that, and I've already sent feedback into Massering. I've been doing that a lot this semester. That Massering was looking for this Lewis structure for CLO, and I think this is wrong. Or at least I think it is not the only Lewis structure you might think is valid. So there's like a problem set problem last night that was looking for this answer. Um, now, with this particular structure, what I think is bad with this one is chlorine is expanding its octet. Uh, but notice how both the O and the CL have a zero formal charge. Like if you're calculating formal charge of chlorine, it should have seven electrons surrounding it. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons surrounding it. For a zero formal charge, the same for O. So formal charge at least isn't, there's nothing with the formal charges that says that structure is bad, but it's just expanding the octet on the chlorine atom with nine electrons surrounding chlorine. Now the lowest structure I would go with and the one I sent into mastering to say that they need to accept this as the right answer would be the one, I think we actually did this in class, so 13 total electrons, 7 plus 6. So it should probably be a single bond, or at least that would be the one I would think would be the most sensible answer. In fact, we were debating, not debating, like with the class debate, but we, were, we had shown these two structures last time where we were trying to weigh which of these two structures makes more sense, the lone pair on chlorine or the lone pair electron on oxygen. And so what we had worked out is that we have a zero formal charge for the left structure for both atoms, and then chlorine would be seven minus six. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons here for a plus one formal charge, oxygens with the minus formal charge. So maximizing formal charges in favor of minimizing formal charges wouldn't lead to a better structure. So we would want, and that maybe goes against the grain of what you might have thought because oxygen being negative is usually good, but not when we're maximizing some other atom's formal charge at the same time. So generally we want to choose the structures that minimize the magnitudes of formal charge as the best answer. So I think mastering perhaps should accept both at the very least, or at least add this one in as a correct answer for that particular question. So if you saw that one and weren't sure why you were wrong, I think it's because mastering just has a finicky answer um, and it wasn't accepting what should have been taken as the correct answer. But good news, that's why I give bonus. Homework's frustrating, I get that. Um, Next week, there's actually, for Thursday's lecture, next week is meant to be kind of a bit of a review of chapter seven through nine before our midterm the following Tuesday. There's a, uh, instead of a normal pre-lecture assignment, it's a pre-lecture set of uh, practice exam problems through mastering, and they're all extra credit. So we'll have a good extra credit assignment next week among all the others. So why don't we do this? Why don't we catch up a bit? Let, can you guys work on NO plus? So try to come up with the Lewis structure for NO plus. So for NO plus, one of the big things to remember is when we have a positively charged ion, we're subtracting electrons for the charge. So we have to take an electron away from the valence shell for the positive charge. So five for nitrogen, plus six for O, minus one for the positive charge, 10 total. Now for diatomic molecules, like we have to satisfy the octet rule when it's possible, meaning we're satisfying the octet rule for both atoms. There's no way around this. Now, for some molecules, remember like BF3, we're not satisfying the octet rule necessarily. 
for beryllium hydride. We're not necessarily satisfying the octet rule. For some molecules, we expand the octet, and that's, that's OK. But for diatomic molecules, when it's possible, we're satisfying the octet rule. Now, when we have an odd count, like in CLO, it's going to be impossible to satisfy the octet rule for both atoms. So with an odd count, even diatomic molecules have to have one atom not satisfying the octet rule. For NO, it just reverts back to looking like N2, so triple bond. Now, what I wanted to point out here is that notice how oxygen ends up with the positive formal charge. So 6 minus 5 for oxygen, 0 formal charge for the nitrogen. Now, you could imagine that O is more electronegative. It's really going to pull the triple bond closer towards itself, not really end up with the full positive charge and the real charge of the molecule, like the effective or the actual charge in O. It's going to be a little bit less than this when you think of the actual polarization of the bond. But the formal charge on O ends up being plus 1. Remember, the formal charge is just assuming the electrons are shared equally, 3 closer to O, 3 closer to N, net charge plus 1 on the O. Real charge, the O is more electronegative. It's going to pull those bonding pair electrons closer towards itself. So one of the ideas of Lewis structures, it's like come up with this structure, imagine the electrons are being equally shared, then release that approximation. Then think about thinking about the electronegativities and how they're going to change or impact the real charges in a real molecule. So plus one formal charge for O, likely formal charge won't be as high in magnitude. Um, the O being positive, there's nothing we can do about that either. You may say, well, O's um, more electronegative. Why is it positive? And it's, it just is. You know, it's just based on satisfying the octet rule, distributing the electrons. There's no other way we can come up with the Lewis structure that both satisfies the octet rule for both atoms. So you could try. There's no way to come up with a double bond. One of the atoms would have to be violating the octet rule. Hello, so I forgot to record the audio for this first slide. If you want to see these examples worked out, just go to the pre-lecture video for this video from uh, before lecture, and I work through the structures there. So if you want to see me work through these examples here, just pop back into the pre-lecture video where I went through all these slides before class. And the last topic in chapter eight is actually revisiting a topic from chapter five of bond strengths. So we see like a bond strength chart here. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out was if you compare like CH to OH to like FH, is to point out that with that trend, where's FH? Right over here. So that in comparing those three bonds, that we're going from nonpolar or non, not very polar CH bond to a more, more polar OH bond to an even more polar um, HF bond, and that the bond strength is increasing. So the developing of charge in the atoms is giving some stronger ionic-like characteristics to the bonds. So having some not quite fully plus one, minus one charges, but having some charges develop in the atoms is strengthening those bonds. In fact, that's why if you look at the bond strengths of HCl, HBr, HI, they're weaker than HF. This is one of the main reasons why HF is actually a weak acid, why it doesn't fully dissociate into water to its ions like HCl, HBr, and HI do. So you may have wondered, why is HF different from the other three um, hydro um, halogen acids? The answer is it just has a stronger bond due to being more polar, stronger charges, higher charges, more attracted together. And so one other characteristic is generally like a longer bond also ends up being weaker. So longer bonds do tend to be a little bit weaker um, because you're like separating those electrons holding the nuclei together. Um, so you don't end up with as strong of a bond. Uh, so then we also see the bond length trends. This is um, highlighting some of the uh, content we saw earlier, that single bonds are longer than double, which are longer than triple bonds. So triple bonds are shorter uh, than double bonds, which are shorter than single bonds. And that trend holds up across all different types of atoms. So triple bonds are shorter, of course, because they have more electrons holding the nuclei together, so contracting the bond distances. So I just we were going to do like a top hat. I don't want to do top hat for this one. Um, so we're mostly work together um, through this one. So what we might do is try to um, remind ourselves of how we might write a combustion reaction. Probably easy to remember. But we're writing the combustion reaction of ethane. So I forgot to write that word combustion in here. So we want to use the bond enthalpy chart to estimate the enthalpy of reaction for the combustion reaction of ethane. So of course ethane is C2H6. And what I want us to remember, just to, to go back through, 
The thought here is that O2 is reacting with a hydrocarbon for it to burn to form CO2 and water. The, um, the bond enthalpy chart assumes all the reactants and products are gases. So this works for estimating delta H. And so that's one of our reviews from chapter five is that we get an approximation of delta H from this approach, not a direct calculation. So we can approximate delta H and, um, and we may also then realize we need a balanced reaction in order to carry this out. I need a three in front of water, which would give me an odd count for oxygen. So I'm going to add a two in front of ethane. So I need four CO2s, then need, um, it's 2H6, so we're going to then need six waters. And so that gives me three plus four for seven O2s. And so then, minorly, to use the bond enthalpy chart, we need to remember double versus single bonds. So of course, we have carbon with single bonds, CH3 is attached, that gives us uh, the right number of bonds for carbon, for four bonds to carbon, O2 double bond, carbon oxygen double bond for CO2, and of course, hydrogen oxygen hydrogen for water. And so we can approximate delta H by taking the sum of the bond strengths of the reactants minus the products, where D is the symbol for bond strengths. And we just remind ourselves from chapter five, it's the um, reactants bond strengths minus the products bond strength. So it may seem strange at first if you remember that it's reactants minus products, but it's because the, like the CH bond strength is the energy it takes to break the CH bond. So a bond strength is how much energy it takes to break a bond, and then forming a bond, you have O and H coming together, let's say, to form OH, Oops. O plus H goes to OH, that forming bonds is exothermic. So the forming of bonds is exothermic, the breaking of bonds is endothermic. So it's like 413 kJs to break that CH bond, but we get back, it's negative 463 kJs when we make the OH bonds. So what we wanna do is try to approximate how much energy does it take to break all the bonds in the reactants, and how much energy do we get back when we make the new bonds in the products. So we're breaking, what, like 12 CH bonds, two carbon-carbon uh, single bonds. We're breaking seven OO double bonds, and then we're making eight CO double bonds, and we're making 12 OH single bonds. So we start thinking of the process. You're thinking, okay, we, we have one, two, three, four, five, six CH bonds times two molecules. So it's like 12 times the 413 KJs. So 12 moles of the bond times 413 kJs per mole. That's the bond strength for the CH bond. And plus two times the carbon-carbon bond strength. That's 348 kJs per mole. Seven O2 double bonds, that's 495. KJs per mole. Then we're subtracting all the bonds and the products. So why don't you guys wrap up that the, the products bonds and complete the calculation?
Okay, so what we get is it takes about 9,000 kJs, 9,117 kJs to break all the bonds in the reactants. That takes energy. So take energy to break all those bonds. And then we get back the energy of the new bonds that we form. So 8 moles times 799, 799 kJs per mole for the CO bonds. And then we're forming 12 moles of the OH bond. So 12 times 463. So we're getting back 11,948 kJs per mole when we form our new bonds. Yes? Um, I think there would be two because um, each molecule just has one bond. So um, there's one carbon-carbon single bond per molecule. So I got minus 2831. Okay, Jay. So we should expect a combustion reaction to be exothermic. So if you're looking at this problem and saying, okay, we're estimating the enthalpy of reaction for a combustion reaction. We should have predicted exothermic, so we get an exothermic reaction out. So if you end up with a positive number, maybe you did products minus reactants, like say on a test down the road. So a combustion reaction should give energy off because we're making more stable bonds. OK. All right, let's head into chapter 9. So chapter 9, I think, makes a lot of sense at this point, because it, it really comes down to, for these molecular compounds, what are their geometries? What do the molecules really look like? So it has a really nice tie-in to, we now know Lewis structures, how to predict and determine Lewis structures. Can we then try to figure out how the actual structures of molecules then fall in line from those structures? So chapter 9 deals with shapes of molecules. We'll get into molecular polarity and how it's different from just simple bond polarity. Chapter 8, bond polarity, would be like this, like for the molecule of CO2. So you have CO2, you would look at this bond and say, I know the CO bond is polar because the, the atoms have different electronegativities and O is a really electronegative atom. So we know these bonds are polarized. So we definitely know from Chapter 8 that we have polar bonds. So Chapter 8 tells us that this bond is polar. So in chapter 9, we need to figure out why it is that the molecule is nonpolar. So in chapter 9, we need to figure out why it is and discuss why this molecule ends up being nonpolar. Now, the answer is mostly pretty straightforward, that you have two dipoles, and dipoles are like vector quantities. You have one dipole pointing one way, the other the opposite way, and they just cancel each other out. So that the actual net dipole moment of the molecule is exactly equal to zero. So the molecule ends up being nonpolar. So the molecule, despite having polar bonds, ends up being nonpolar. If we start thinking about what polarity is really meaning to tell us, it's really trying to tell us if there's like a pull of charge on the molecule. Does one side of the molecule have a different charge than the opposite side? But for CO2, it's, it ends up being that the negative charge on one side of the molecule is exactly the same charge as the other side of the molecule. So if you like dangle a positive charge in front of CO2, it's just going to like spin. Like not one side of the molecule is more attracted to that charge than the other side. So you can imagine the two O's fighting to get to that positive charge. The net effect is the molecule doesn't do anything. And so another effect that this has is if you have two adjacent CO2 molecules, there's just repulsion. There's no net built-in attraction between those molecules. And that has a pretty big consequence on some of the bulk properties of like carbon dioxide versus something that ends up being polar in terms of the molecule, like water. So CO2 being nonpolar uh, means that two adjacent CO2 molecules not very attracted together, so it's going to be easier for like a solid chunk. Imagine you go down to zero Kelvin. Everything's a solid at zero Kelvin. Um, so you go down to zero Kelvin, and you start warming up from there and imagining at what point are things going to start to melt. The things that have the weakest attraction for each other are going to melt first. The molecules that have a stronger attraction towards themselves will melt later. So if you have like NaCl, so really strong electrostatic forces of attraction, takes a really high temperature, like 800 Kelvin, to melt NaCl. If you're talking 2 plus 2 minus, calcium oxide melting points over 2,500 degrees C. So very high when you then double the charges. So higher lattice energies, higher melting point. Water, we end up with a built-in charge. So why is that? Well, water ends up having a different structure due to the lone pairs. So water ends up having a bent bond instead of a linear bond in CO2. So water, due to the electron pairs, here ends up having a bent bond that's not 180 degrees, so its dipoles don't cancel out. So we have dipoles pointing in towards oxygen, 
partial negative charge on top, partial positive charges on the hydrogen. So the top end of our molecule is minus charge, the bottom end of our molecule is plus charge. So if you have one water molecule and then another one right on top of it, so imagine a water molecule sitting on top, you then have plus minus attraction built right into the molecule. So you get stronger interactions. It's kind of like in between being a nonpolar, having repulsive interactions, um, and like ionic, where they have really strong plus minus interactions. So water kind of ends up being in the middle, so it has somewhat intermediate melting points and boiling points compared to nonpolar compounds, uh, um, and then, but not quite as high as ionic compounds. So liquids, specifically in solids we discuss in chapters 11 and 12, we'll be saying and going through mostly what I was just talking about here when we're discussing the major differences between classes of compounds when we get later into the class. Um, lastly, in chapter 9, we'll talk about some different models of bonding. So we'll talk about things like hybrid um, um, orbital theory. We'll talk about molecular orbital theory just to try to understand how bonds form and some different characteristics of bonding. Okay, so for molecular shape, CCL4, we mentioned this before. I wanted to lead with this example here in class that um, CCL4, we can't interpret the structure as being planar. It doesn't really have 90 degree bond angles. Um, in the real molecule. It looks like it might in the Lewis structure, but the Lewis structure is not necessarily meant to be a depiction of three-dimensional shape. So the three-dimensional shape of carbon tetrachloride ends up being different than like a flat molecule because these lines represent electrons, and those electrons are negatively charged and hence repel each other. So the repulsions of the electron pairs in the bonds of these molecules are going to say 90 degrees is too close. 90 degrees puts the electron pairs closer together than if they could have a, a wider bond angle. So if the molecule could adopt a different structure, it would, and it does. So it adopts a tetrahedral arrangement, such as this one here, where we have carbon. I like to make sure we know how to draw these things on paper to try to depict three-dimensional shape. We have a carbon, chlorine, chlorine in like the plane of our paper that we're writing in. Then one of the chlorines comes straight out at us. Not straight out. It comes wedged out at us. And then another chlorine goes back. And these bond angles here end up all being exactly 109.5 degrees. We're not going to derive that. That would be like a math class. But a perfect tetrahedron works out to have exactly 109.5 degree bond angles the whole way around the molecule. So now the name tetrahedron um, doesn't actually come necessarily from the four chlorines in the molecule. It actually comes from the structure you get having four sides to a pyramid. So in this tetrahedron, you'd have a carbon atom in the middle and then the four bonding pairs at the wedges of this pyramid structure. So the tetrahedron is just in the four equivalent sided pyramid you get from like the connection of the chlorine atoms. Now the only reason I mentioned that here is we're going to see when we get to octahedral that the octa won't mean we have eight things attached to an atom. It's actually only going to be six, but we're going to see there how we get an eight sided pyramid and the octa is relating to the, the, the sides of the pyramid that we get in a larger structure. So all the bonds end up being the same length in carbon tetrachloride. All the bond angles end up being exactly the same, 109.5 degrees. Now, what do you guys think? Do you think this would be a polar or nonpolar molecule? Nonpolar molecule. And the easiest way to picture this is the bonds are still polar. We're not changing what we learned in chapter 8, that the chlorines are still more electronegative than carbon. NOFCLBr, like sulfur, those are the most electronegative atoms. You pair anything up with them, of course, you're going to end up with a polar bond. So we still have all this negative charge residing on the chlorine atoms, but the key is the whole molecule ends up being almost a ball of minus charge. So if you picture two side-by-side -side, um, CCL4 molecules, you would just have the chlorine atom negative charges interacting with the other negative charge on the other chlorine atoms. We don't have a difference of charge in the molecule. If I actually replace those chlorines, if I took one of the chlorines off and could replace it with like an H atom or a fluorine atom, anything different that just disturbs and makes the charges not exactly the same, then the molecule would be polar. So if we had something like C, Cl, Cl, chlorine coming out at us, and then I replace the back chlorine with an H atom, that's chloroform. So this would be the mole, you don't have to know the name, but the name's chloroform for that compound. This molecule is polar. So this molecule would be polar because we don't have the charges exactly the same on all the sides of the molecule. We'd have one negative charge on one side of the molecule, a different charge in the back end of the molecule. So when we're assessing um, polarity, we get nonpolar molecules whenever we have like the exact same atom attached on all sides of the molecule. And so we'll see quite a few examples. So CCL4, nonpolar, 
chloroform with a hydrogen instead of a chlorine, that would end up being polar. If we had um, CH2Cl2, this is where we have to be a little careful. Like a lot of times, there's nothing wrong with sketching a Lewis structure for like, uh, uh, excuse me, dichloromethane, CH2Cl2. For CH2Cl2, you may draw this structure, this Lewis structure here. It looks like our chlorines are opposite each other, and that might make you think the molecule is nonpolar, but what's wrong with that determination? The, that's not the actual structure. So the bond angle of the chlorine, carbon chlorine is really not 180 degrees. So these dipoles don't cancel each other out. This molecule is indeed polar, but it's because its shape is really a tetrahedron shape. Because it has four total bonding domains, no non-bonding domains, so it takes the shape of a tetrahedron, and then we get dipoles pointing this way, so we get negative charge on this side of the molecule that's not balanced by the opposite side of the molecule. So that molecule ends up being polar. Okay, so let's look at, um, compare methane, four total domains, meaning we have four bonds, no lone pairs. In the case of methane, or excuse me, in the case of NH3, of course, we'd have N, H, 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 lone pair on the nitrogen. So we have a lone pair of electrons that ends up occupying one of the spots of our tetrahedron. Now, for reasons, I guess, just to confuse you guys, we give two different names to the geometry of something like ammonia. We can name the electron domain geometry, the geometry of all of the electron domains, including the non-bonding pair. The, the domain would be tetrahedral electron domain. But then we name something different. We name a geometry for just the actual bonds, for the molecular shape of the atoms. The reason here is that if you're trying to do like an X-ray diffraction experiment, you can diffract the uh, X-ray beams off the atoms, but not the electrons. So when you do like a X-ray crystallography experiment or some uh, experiment to get structure, you can see where the atoms are in the molecule, but not the electrons. And so you may just want to determine the shape of the actual atoms in the molecule and give them a name. Now, the shape of the molecule is still dependent on all four of those domains. It still depends on this being a tetrahedrally shaped molecule. Uh, because if you think it only depends on the three bonds, you might think it would go trigonal planar. Uh, but the electron pair kicks the whole domain into tetrahedral and then the hydrogens are then outside of the plane of the nitrogen atom, so our nitrogen's in a different plane, hence the name's trigonal pyramidal. So you get a pyramid structure, three-dimensional shape, not a planar molecule, so we have two words, like planar versus non-planar, and then polar versus non-polar. Polar has to do with bond polarity versus molecular polarity, and planar just has to do with, are all the atoms in the exact same plane as each other, or is, it, is there a three-dimensional shape for the molecule? So this molecule would be non-planar. So non-planar, but what about polar versus non-polar? <laughs> CH4, of course, is polar, or is non-polar, for the same reason that CCl4 is non-polar. So CH4 would not be polar. The CH bond is also not particularly polar either, so you may not have expected it to even be polar if it could have had some different charges on one end of the molecule compared to another. <laughs> NH3, on the other hand, is polar because we have these bond dipoles pointing towards the more electronegative N. So the N forms with a partial negative charge and then the hydrogens with partial positive charges. So we have a big positive charge on the hydrogen side of the molecule, a big negative charge on the top end of the molecule, just like we saw with water. And then going back through water, would show us that water is also fitting into the tetrahedral domain, having four total domains, two lone pairs, two non-bonding pairs, for having four domains. So having four total domains kicks us into that tetrahedral shape for all of the electron domains. So we have electron pair here, electron pair here, roughly 109.5 degree bond angles, and then we would have our roughly 109.5 degree bond angles for our hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen bond angles still within that tetrahedral base shape. Water, of course, ends up being polar, just like we sh showed earlier. Positive charges, partial negative charge on O. Oxygen's more electronegative, pulls electrons towards itself. So water, of course, is polar. Okay, now, something that happens, like if you look at the bond angles in methane, they all have to be perfect tetrahedral. So there's nothing breaking or changing these away from that exactly 109.5 degree bond angle. What about ammonia? 
Well, ammonia, like the electron pair, that lone pair of electrons, the dots represent two electrons. So electrons are negatively charged particles. It, they don't have another nuclei pulling them further away from the nucleus. So they end up being a little closer to the nucleus, like a little bit larger in size. What that means is that the bonding pairs in ammonia are going to experience a greater repulsion due to the lone pair of electrons. That's going to compress the bond angles away from perfect 109. Bond angles in ammonia, like if you look at the N uh, bond angle with the two hydrogens, that bond angle is about 107 degrees, not 109. And that's because the bonding pair electrons, there's electrons in the bond, they repel each other, but not as much as that lone pair repels them. So the lone pair is forcing the bonding pairs a little bit closer together than what you might expect. And then if you believe that to be true, then you would probably predict water should be slightly worse because it has two lone pairs then pressing into the bonding pair electrons. And so then for the case of water, the bond angle here in the real molecule ends up being about 104 degrees. So about 107, about two degrees off from where you expect for ammonia and about five degrees off from where you expect water's bond angles to be. Okay, so then a picture showing polarity trends would be that CO2, we get the same minus charge on the ends of the molecule, no difference in charge. In order for a molecule to be polar, like HCl for example, partial negative on chlorine, partial positive on hydrogen, big negative charge on this end of the molecule, positive charge on this side. Definitely HCl. Uh, in fact, all diatomic molecules that have polar bonds have to be polar molecules. But then when you have three or more atoms in your molecule, if they're arranged in such a way that those dipoles cancel themselves out, you end up with a perfectly nonpolar molecule with a dipole moment of exactly zero for, um, for CO2. And then for water, it ends up with an overall dipole moment or an overall polarity. Dipole moment of water is close to two Debye, so it has a pretty large dipole moment, indicating it has relatively highly charged atoms, allowing them to be more attracted together um, than something like the atoms in CO2. All right, so I did this thing with, I don't know how this will go over, we'll see. Um, on Top Hat today, we haven't started with the question. I put a timer on this just for fun, because I know you guys like fun games. So this is the question, how many total domains? So total domains would be for like ammonia, four total domains. Water has four total domains. The water has two bonding domains and um, two non-bonding domains. So a domain is just when we look at an atom connected to another atom, double, single, triple bonds, like CO2 only has two domains. So CO2 has two domains. They're double bonds, but one of the double bonds is one domain, the other double bond is the other domain. Think about the total domains of sulfide ion. All right, give it a try. <laughs> 
ones. So there's one total domain, but two. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. I got yeah. That. Yeah, we'll, we'll review that again. Just make sure. Okay, so that was exciting. Well, like with the timer feel, it feels like a test, you know, so that's what I wanted to replicate is like a test feel with like a timer. So we'll play around with that. If, it's, if it works, it works. Now, what I was saying before the question, if you're looking at CO2, just two domains. So if you have two domains and we we'll get as far away from each other as possible, then they have a bond angle of 180 degrees. And if they went like 90 degrees and those bond domains would be really close together, there'd be no reason why CO2 would form with anything other than perfectly 180 degree bond angles. And then for SO3, what's really important is that we recognize that 26 total electrons we've distributed, or in my structure I have 24 electrons shown, so I need two extra electrons on sulfur. And so then that kicks this molecule into having four total domains. Um, one of them is a non-bonding pair, and then two, three, and four. And so then we had maybe some um, discussions last time on do you make multiple bonds or not within this type of structure. And so remember how this one would satisfy the octet rule. <laughs> And then if you make, a, you could make a double bond if you want to minimize formal charges because this ends up with a formal charge of sulfur of zero, minuses on the O's. So this is the formal charge structure. Now, for the sake of chapter nine, it almost doesn't make a difference. Notice how either one of the two structures, if you're not sure which one's the better Lewis structure, it does, the answer to the question doesn't depend on either structure. We're still counting this as one, two, three, four total domains. So we have four domains, whether or not you're looking at either one of those Lewis structures. And then because of resonance, all of the SO bonds are of the exact same length in the exact same bond order, even if you think that this structure here is the right Lewis structure. So even if we're looking at this Lewis structure here, we should still be considering that all the SO bonds are exactly the same as each other. Um, and one of them isn't really a double bond. The other two aren't really singles in any given moment. All these bonds are really four-thirds order and exactly the same in terms of their bond length um, properties. And so then we see that more clearly perhaps within the octet rule structure that all the SO bonds are the same length and we wouldn't have that issue within that Lewis structure. So within chapter nine, it almost doesn't make a difference in terms of some of the predictions you might make in terms of structure. Both of these molecules on either Lewis structure you would predict would be trigonal pyramidal. So if the next part of this question was, well, what's the molecular geometry name for this molecule? The molecular geometry would be trigonal uh, pyramidal. So we get a pyramidal shape of three atoms in making that pyramid. So we'd have O, uh, sulfur, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen coming out, and then perhaps that lone pair of electrons going backwards. So we'd have minus formal charges if we're satisfying the octet rule. Um, for all of them. So trigonal pyramidal shape for the atoms. The electron domain geometry name, of course, would be tetrahedral. So for naming the electron domain geometry, electron domain would, of course, be tetrahedral. OK, so if we review um, some of the ideas of Vesper, the valence shell, yes? OK. Um, so if we, if we go back through. Um, a chart comparing the valence shell, so the valence shell, the outermost electrons, those are the electrons that repel the most. So the electron pair repulsion model says the outer valence electrons in the valence shell repel each other, giving molecules their shape. If we have two total domains and they're bonding, this would be the case of something like CO2, going perfectly linear in its bond angle. But if we have something that has three atoms with no lone pairs of electrons, like BF3, so for BF3, central boron, three fluorines, they satisfy their octets. The key is no lone pair on boron. So because there's no lone pair of electrons on boron, then there's no extra electron. This molecule has to distribute these three domains as best as it can to minimize those repulsions of those electrons in those bonds. So if if we had something like this, this would probably be silly, right? If you had boron with a linear fluorine and a fluorine over here, you see how that's maximizing the repulsions of the bonding pair electrons with each other? 
like we'd be reducing the, the interactions of the 180 degree bonding pair electrons, but then maximizing or increasing their interactions with that 90 degree electron pair. So we can reduce those repulsions with perfect 120 degree bond angles. So 120 degree bond angles for trigonal planar. So planar is, means that all four of those atoms exist within the same plane. If boron wanted to like retreat into the page and the forms wanted to come out, you see how the bonding angles would get closer together. We'd be approaching those bond angles of trigonal pyramidal of 109.5 degrees, putting the electron pairs closer together. That would increase their repulsions. That wouldn't make any sense for something like BF3. So then something like CCL4, as we saw before, fits into the uh, tetrahedral shape. Um, and so then whenever we have two total domains, the shape's taking the linear shape, three total domains, we're taking the trigonal planar shape, four total domains, we're taking the tetrahedral shape. Likewise, if we continue, something like PF5 and SF6 have five and six total domains respectively. PF5's Lewis structure will look like this. So we have five fluorines attached. So if we do a quick count, five for phosphorus, seven times five for the fluorines, that's 40 total electrons. And so if we have five fluorines with eight electrons each, that would be all 40 electrons. Just showing, making sure we see in the Lewis structure, there's no lone pair of electrons on phosphorus. So what we end up with is like an internal set of three fluorines around the phosphorus on a trigonal plane. So we have three atoms all in the same plane as each other with that central phosphorus. Then we have two fluorines that are on an axis together. So the two fluorines, notice only two of the fluorines in PF5 share an axis together, or they have that bond angle of 180 degrees. And then the other fluorines aren't connected directly on an axis. They're 120 degrees relative to each other. So one of the things that happens for something like PF5 is it actually has like two different types of fluorine. It has fluorines that we, you might call the equatorial position on the equator of the molecule. So these would be the equatorial position. And then the axial positions are the two atoms that are on an axis together. We'll see when we kick an electron pair into this structure and have four bonding domains and one lone pair that it's kind of relevant for us to notice that there's actually two possible sites we might put the electron pair in. We have to figure out which one's better. Now for the case of octahedral, that's the case of something like SF6. So SF6 would have six for sulfur, seven times six for fluorine for um, 48 electrons total in the valence shell. So we're gonna have three fluorine, sulfur, fluorine bonds all on an axis together. So we're gonna end up with three sets of axial SF. Um, FSF bonds. No lone pairs on sulfur, eight per F, six Fs, so 48 total electrons. So now the name's octahedral, and that's where I wanted to come back to him by pointing out tetrahedral had four shapes on, a, um, on the pyramid. Notice here we would connect and have a four-sided pyramid on top of the molecule then a four-sided pyramid on the bottom. Bless you. So we have like a four-sided pyramid up top and a four-sided pyramid down below. That's where the oct is coming from. The eight-sided hedral shape is the eight-sided pyramid that results from having six outer fluorines on the molecule. Okay, so you may confuse yourself and think octahedral should have been SF8. But it's not SF8, because the octa doesn't refer to the count of atoms on sulfur, but rather, rather the size of the pyramid that emerges from the structure. So all the bond angles are 90 degrees. All the fluorines are actually exactly the same. So we don't have this equatorial versus axial problem um, with, S, with uh, the fluorine sulfur fluorine bonds. They're all axial. So all of these bonds here are axial. here, because I didn't actually say this name yet and explain the name. So trigonal is that trigonal shape that we mentioned for the, the, the three fluorines on the equator of the molecule, and then we get the bipyramid structure. So you get a bipyramid above and below that trigonal plane. So a bipyramid is getting two pyramids uh, emerging from that trigonal plane. 
Um, I maybe I don't know if I'm losing you guys or not, but we'll do a few examples here in a minute. But for octahedral, is anybody can anybody think of a second name that you might come up with for octahedral that would be like trigonal bipyramidal? Like square shape, so you have like a square equator with a bipyramid. So you might have called this square bipyramidal uh, because you have a square shape just like the trigonal shape with a bipyramid above and below. So if we review a little bit of, of shapes of molecules, methane, perfect bond angles, 109.5 degrees. Ammonia would have been perfect 109.5 degrees if the lone pair bond pair interactions were exactly the same as the repulsions of the bond pairs with themselves. So since this angle is a little bit compressed, it's that lone pair compressing into those bond pairs, forcing those bonding pair electrons closer together. Uh, a little bit worse for water, as we said earlier. Um, it's even, um, we can even notice a change in bond angles for something like chlorine carbon, chlorine bonded to an oxygen. This is a trigonal planar molecule. We know it's trigonal planar because it has three total domains, meaning those bond angles should have been close to 120 degrees and the molecule is totally existing within one single plane. So the molecule really is planar. There's no deviation here, but notice how the bond angle increases for the oxygen carbon chlorine angle. That's because we now have four bonding pair electrons in that double bond, repelling the two single bonds a little bit more. So we have more electrons here, and they're actually closer to carbon because oxygen's smaller, the bond length's a little bit smaller. So these electron pairs are closer to the carbon atom, closer to the chlorine bond, pushing those chlorine bonds together, reducing their bond angle. So they're close to 120. You may say they're approximately 120 degrees, but we could predict that the bond angle of the double bonded oxygen to chlorine will be a little bit greater due to the added repulsions, due to the extra electrons, and the slightly shorter bond. If we then look at uh, the case where you kick an electron pair off of, uh, if you take PF5, trigonal bipyramidal. Um, in fact, let's pop back for a second. Okay, so for SF4, what it has is a lone pair of electrons in one of the spots of the trigonal bipyramidal uh, shape. So when we start looking at a molecule, we would count and say, okay, one domain, two, three, four, five. Five domains should fit that five domain shape of trigonal bipyramidal. And then we replace an electron pair what I want us to see here is that these fluorines are being compressed inward by that lone pair, because the lone pair interactions are a little bit greater. So the fluorine to sulfur to fluorine bond angle is 174 degrees, meaning it's being compressed from 180 due to that bond pair of electrons pressing into and reducing that bond angle. The same thing with that internal bond angle should have been closer to 120, it's closer to 116 due to, again, greater lone pair bond pair interactions than the bond pair, bond pair interactions. Now let's kind of come back to how this structure was, how do we come up with that structure? Why is that the right structure for SF4 and how do we name it? Okay, before we get there, let's name these structures. So let's go through a couple examples of molecular geometry. So like HCN, Lewis structure wise, I like from the, the um, hydrogen peroxide example at the start of class, I think simple first. If I can't simply solve a Lewis structure, then I start counting electrons. Um, so for like HCN, by simple, I mean four bonds to carbon, three to nitrogen, and a lone pair. And then if we want to double check the count of electrons just to make sure we didn't screw up, we could do that. For 10 electrons, should be distributed, two, four, six, eight, 10, and we're good. Zero formal charges all the way around. So really easy, I didn't have to do a lot of work to get HCN's Lewis structure. Now I have one domain, two domains. So this is a linear molecule. So whenever we have three atoms connected, it really becomes a question, is it a perfectly linear bond with an angle of 180 degrees, or is it some type of bent bond with some type of non 180 degree bond angle? So like ozone, oh, oh, like I kind of know ozone's trickier, and we've done ozone as an example before. Like ozone's not one where I'm going to be able to apply two bonds to oxygen. <laughs> I'm going to have to piece together one O, another O, another O. Three times six electrons, 18 total. And so that gives me 16 electrons if I give the outer O's their octet. That's really important for seeing the two leftover electrons need to go on oxygen. So of course, without even completing the structure, we know this is going to be trigonal planar electron domain. And then 
the shape that we should get, since it's going to be in the trigonal plane, approximately 180 degree bond angles. If we want to finish the Lewis structure, we would get this structure here. The double bond on one side, we'd have the resonance structure with the other O. The bonds would be exactly the same bond order of about three halves, so a little bit longer than a uh, double bond, a little bit shorter than a single bond. So we can kind of characterize some of the properties of the bonds of the molecule. Um, something we haven't talked a whole lot about is the charge of oxygen. So if the bonds are really all three halves bond order, so we have the three bonding pairs spreading out at all times across those two bonds, three bonding pairs of electrons across the two OO bonds, what are the charges on O? Are they exactly the same two for the outer O's? What about the inner oxygen? Well, the inner oxygen's always positive charge because it's always six minus five in either one of those two resonance structures. So the central O is always plus one. And then the outer O's, it's like it's either minus one or zero averaged out. So the O's in the real molecule on the outer oxygen are minus one half charged. So you see how one resonance structure shows their charge is zero, the other is minus one? Well, the real molecule would have the oxygens always with the charge of minus one half for those charges, is, charges averaging out. So the real structure of the molecule should be the composite or the average of those two possible resonance structures, and these charges should work out on the outer O's to be exactly the same. Kind of just rehashing something out of chapter eight. Now for chapter nine, none of that discussion matters too much, because all we need to know is one domain, two domain, three domains, trigonal planar shape has to be a bent bond, meaning it's not a 180 degree bond, it's closer to 120. So the molecular geometry name here would be simply bent. If we're naming the molecular geometry of water, it's also bent. So even though water is in the trigonal or in the tetrahedral domain, we still call this bond angle bent as well. So notice that you get a bent bond angle in the case of tetrahedral with two bonding domains and in the case of trigonal planar with two bonding domains. It's just because the bond is not linear. The best way to describe the bond is by bent. OF2, very similar to water. Six plus two times seven, that's 20 electrons. Fluorines, their octet, that's 16 electrons, four electrons on the O. So bent bond, just like water, just like ozone's bond. Now polarity, because we're supposed to predict um, polarity trends here. Is HCM polar? Yeah, because the nitrogen's more electronegative, we get a negative charge here. Um, carbon's more electronegative, we get a positive charge here. Different charges on these sides of the molecule, so definitely a polar molecule for HCN. Ozone's tricky. What do you guys think about ozone? Is it polar or nonpolar? So at first glance, you may say, well, how can the a molecule with only oxygen be polar? Well, to be polar, all you need is a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the opposite, or two different charges on the different ends of the molecule. Positive charge on one side, negative half charge on the opposite side. That molecule is definitely polar. So we would expect ozone to have a dipole moment, meaning it, the dipole moment wouldn't be perfectly zero. It just should have a dipole moment. OF2, where do the dipoles point? Towards the fluorine, because the fluorine's more electronegative than O. Fluorines are picking up the minus charge. In fact, the electronegative, the, um, um, what's that? the uh, oxidation number of fluorines are minus one. Oxidation number of oxygen would be plus two, indicating oxygen should be the partial positive atom, the fluorine should be the negatively charged atom. So the uh, oxidation number rules were really just pointing towards relative electronegativities. So more negative fluorine atom, definitely a polar molecule. Bond angles for tetrahedral shapes should be close to 109.5. This bond angle should be less than 109.5 degrees based off what we know from um, uh, comparing like the examples of water being slightly reduced off of its tetrahedral bond angle. Okay, so molecular geometry names, bond angles, like PF5 we saw earlier, that's the trigonal bipyramidal. So we won't go through that shape here again. But if we're going to lose an electron pair uh, or electron domain as a bonding domain and change it to a non-bonding domain, that's the case of SF4. 6 plus 4 times 7, that's 34 total electrons. That 34 is where we're going to get that extra electron pair. 
So now this is, turns out to be the most stable structure of SF6. And if you picture SF6, it kind of looks like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. So the geometry name here is seesaw. Now, you may wonder, why is that the shape of SF4 and not this one here? So what about this structure here? We have sulfur. Imagine we have the fluorines on the trigonal plane intact, and we have the electron pair here instead. Notice how there's like two possibilities that we could have considered. Which bonding pair side of like PF5 do we want to switch into an electron pair? The axial fluorine or one of the equatorials? Well, the answer is that the real molecule, the way you would figure this out is you would go look at the actual structure of the molecule and see which one it's closer to, and it's closer to the seesaw shape. So nature is kind of going to tell us the answer to which one has the least repulsions. Because like physics would just say, well, whichever structure has the least electron um, pair repulsions will be the best structure. So it must be the case, since this isn't the best structure, that the um, lone pair um, being on top of the molecule is just not as good of a structure, leads to more repulsions. Now you can reason this out and say, well, we're probably going to get 90 degree interactions, three of them in that structure, and only two of those interactions here. So we're like reducing that lone pair, bonding pair interactions through SF4 in the seesaw shape. So what, what I want us to understand is just we can memorize the shape and we can put some ideas to, well, there were two possibilities, and this one, the seesaw shape, ended up being better for molecules like SF4. So anything with <coughs> four bonding domains and one non-bonding domain is going to fit this shape of a seesaw molecular geometry. So the electron domain <coughs> geometry is still a trigonal bipyramidal, but the shape of the molecule of just the atoms takes the seesaw shape. Now what about replacing another pair of electrons with a bond pair? That's the case of ClF3. So the case of ClF3, the Lewis structure has three fluorine atoms, lone pairs on the chlorines, two sets. You could count up the electrons and see you end up with two pairs of electrons. So for the central chlorine, we're still going to be fitting into the base um, structure. I may draw an out. I'll draw the wedge. So we can start with the base trigonal pyramidal structure, and then we're going to put um, and the molecule ends up being T-shaped. So we can put the fluorines in the shape that gives us a T-shape. So we get this T-shape. If we were to flip on its side, it would look like a letter T. And then the lone pairs will be sticking straight, uh, sticking out of the page and into the page on that trigonal planar part of the structure. So our bond angles are going to be compressed inward here. So we would predict 90 degree bond angles. But because the electron pair repulsions will be slightly less than 90 degrees in terms of those bond angles. Now, what do we think about the polarity of SF4 and the polarity of ClF3? Polar or nonpolar? So this is polar because we don't have a fluorine atom opposite sulfur to balance out the charge. So we get big negative charge on this side of the molecule and then nothing opposite the molecule to counter that charge. PF5 is a nonpolar molecule. So if we have fluorines on all sides of that trigonal bipyramidal shape, then that becomes, or could be classified as being a nonpolar molecule, but replace a lone pair of electrons, then all of a sudden we have a polar molecule. Polar also in the case of ClF3. Now xenon F2, xenon does form compounds, but at low temperatures and under some uh, strange conditions, not easily, you, you can't easily just get these compounds to form, but xenon would have eight valence electrons and then plus 2 times 7 for the fluorines. That gives us a total of 22 valence electrons. So that would look like central xenon, fluorine, fluorine. Now the question here would be, three atoms, is it going to be a linear geometry or a bent geometry? Well, what ends up happening is the electron pairs take the position on the trigonal plane around the xenon atom, and then the bond angle ends up being perfectly 180. So we end up with a perfect linear bond. So the molecule shape is linear. And what about the polarity? What do you guys think? The fluorines are opposite each other. This is just like CO2. This ends up being nonpolar. So the electron pairs, they're, they're, the things we really want to look at are the nuclei. The nuclei are where the charge will reside overall in the molecule. Yes. So um, uh, oh, the CLF3 um, would be T-shaped. 
So we call. So what we're trying to name with the molecular shape is what's the best name to give the shape of the atoms and the molecule, they still depend on all the electron domains. We're just naming the shape that we can best describe as the atoms. Seesaw for SF4, T-shape for ClF3, linear for xenon fluoride. So nonpolar non for xenon fluoride. So if we then go through SF6, SF6 is that octahedral shape that we saw earlier. This would end up being nonpolar. So we have fluorines on all sides of the octahedral shape. If we replace that with a lone pair of electrons, in the case of BRF5, we have 42 electrons, 7 times 6. So what we end up with is bromine with a pair of electrons with the fluorine atoms and every other spot of our octahedron. Now with SF4, we had choices to make, or we had two possibilities. We had some possibilities for the others, but I think what we can do is just say, well, whenever we have three domains, two non-bonding, the molecule takes the shape of a T-shaped structure. If we have two bonding domains, three non-bonding domains, we take a linear shape like xenon fluoride. But if we have five total domains in bonding plus one non-bonding domain, that's six domains. So the overall geometry is octahedral. Every position in octahedron is the same. So we don't have this issue of there being two possibilities with octahedral. So the only possibility here is that we're left with this square pyramid structure. So the reason why I mentioned octahedral could have been named square bipyramidal was because if you have that fluorine on top, then you have a bipyramid. If you lose that with an electron pair, you only have the bottom half of the pyramid. So the name here would be square pyramidal. So it's not bipyramidal. It's only bipyramidal if you get two pyramid structures. <coughs> Well, if you look at the shape, I think you can see the shape. I mean, so I don't know. I think I would memorize or understand how you predict the shapes of molecules. So if you have five domains and one non-bonding, five bonding plus a non-bonding domain, then it takes this shape. If you can see the shape, I think you'll guess the name correctly, because you're just trying to describe a square plane of fluorines with one fluorine downward. That takes the shape of a square pyramid. If you have two lone pairs of electrons, let me finish this and we'll take your question. So xenon with four fluorines and a pair of electrons above and below, because xenon F4 ends up with two lone pairs of electrons, four bonds for six domains still, so it's still in this octahedral domain. It takes a perfect uh, square planar geometry. We get a perfect square plane, perfect 90 degree bond angles all the way around. Polarity, xenon F4, what do you think in terms of the polarity? It's like two xenon F2s, perfect 90 degree bond angles. They each cancel each other out. So all these dipoles are creating these negative charges that are all equally opposing each other. Xenon F4 is nonpolar. Bromine, uh, BRF5, what do you guys think in terms of the polarity? It's polar. We get all these negative charges that are not countered by a negative charge on top of the molecule. So we get a charge imbalance in this molecule, and this one is polar. Okay, so nonpolar for square. So our name here would be square planar. So BR, BRF5 kind of has a square plane, but with an extra fluorine sticking downward, giving it that pyramidal structure. So square pyramidal for BRF5, square planar for xenon F4. So all these atoms are in the same plane. So I think if you're memorizing anything, I would try to think of the shape, see, make sense of the shape name with the molecule. So try to sketch the shape, look at the name, and make sure you see why it's named that. So then you'll understand the name so you're not memorizing a bunch of random names. All right, we'll pick up from there on uh, Tuesday. Have a great weekend.